Okay, so what we're going to try and focus on in this module is the specific hazards that are associated with volcanoes. So in the previous module, we talked about the different types of volcanoes. So hopefully you were able to kind of tag the composition with a type of volcano, because that's kind of the key here, right? So the terms that we use for igneous rocks, mafic, right? That was the dark colored, think Hawaii type of magma or lava. So this is the really fluid stuff. It flows very easily. So hopefully you were able to remember that mafic means that. And of course, it makes these big, broad, flat volcanoes, which we're calling shield volcanoes. And then, of course, there was the intermediate version. That's a compositional term, intermediate. And so now we increase the silica content. We get a little thicker and gooier. And these kind of form the classic volcanoes that we think about, like, you know, this picture here, the stratocone. Right, that's the kind of uh, Cascade Range. That's the Mount St. Helens. That's the Mount Fuji. You know, it looks like you know when you picture a volcano in your head. These do a little of everything. They're they're thick and gooey enough to have violent explosions, but they can also because there's a range there. Remember, you know, if they're closer to the mafic composition, they can get lava flows. Those flow down the sides, do some damage, and then the next eruption might be a little more, you know, intermediate or even to the felsic side, and then we get kind of a, a blast. And then material gets thrown up and the atmosphere falls back down. This is how we build those cones. And then, of course, the last one is the felsic version, which we can get small little domes. But this is the really thick, gooey stuff. And, of course, we also associate with that with what's called a caldera-type volcano, right? These are the uh, Yellowstone-type volcanoes. These are the, if you believe Discovery Channel, right, these are the global killers, right? They, they have huge amounts of volume of magma in the subsurface and they're so violent that they can eject just massive amounts of material into the atmosphere cause a lot of damage and potentially cause climate change because there's so much you know not good so we don't want that to happen so we're going to talk about those specific hazards even though last week we focused more on composition and eruptive style right does it blow up big or is it kind of oozy kind of stuff and so one of the things that we're going to jump back and forth on on this PowerPoint is this USGS Volcanic Hazards Program. And so they have a list of the hazards that we can go visit and we can kind of work through those and then hopefully tag those back to the specific types of volcanoes. So, of course, some volcanoes are going to have multiple hazards. Some only have a couple. And so when we look at the types of hazards, we can see them. This is what the USGS page looks like. I can bring it over here for you. And so here it is here. You can see it's listing the hazards here as ash. So this is the, the small sm material that's ejected in the atmosphere. It kind of falls down almost like snow. Talks about lava flows, lahars, which are really just mud flows that are associated with volcanoes. We have volcanic gas that's released that can be toxic. And then we have what are called pyroclastic flows, right? These are uh, hot gases and boulders that race down the side of mountain fronts and cause damage. And then we can also get landslides from eruptions or even from just volcanoes, or sorry, just from earthquakes. If it shakes the volcano, it's unstable, we can get landslides there. So if I jump back to our slide here really fast, we can go to our first kind of hazard that we might talk about and might you might be familiar with, lava flows. So you can see from the image here, these are dark in color. So Let's be clear, you can get lava flows from cascade type volcanoes, intermediate. But the dominant thing that we see in the very mafic types of eruptions, think Hawaii, shield volcanoes, these are these lava flows. That's the biggest hazard that we see. And because it's fluid, it can travel long distances. And so near the source where it's coming out of the ground, it's obviously super hot and it's super fluid. So temperature is another factor. But because it's so fluid, we don't get these big blasts because all the gas can escape easily. And then we get these flows. As it moves farther from the source, it slows down, but it keeps moving. So it's still a hazard, of course. And so uh, there's obviously, you know, there's a bunch of stuff you could see. So here's a quick clip from YouTube, you know, from Hawaii. And we see that, you know, that looks pretty scary. You can see it's pretty fluid. Of course, 
because it's so hot, it can catch fire. So here you can see it's moving pretty slow. We get these kind of fountains. There's pressure here, but we're not getting a big blast. And of course, here you can see, you know, that thing's not, um, there's a little time lapse here. This is not going super fast. It's far from the source, so it's cooled down. So that temperature that allows it to flow very quickly, it's not happening here, but it's kind of just trucking along because there's a supply behind it that keeps pushing it and it's just going downhill wherever the slope is that's where our lava is going to flow and of course the hazard besides getting run over by a volcano or by a lava flow is it burns structures destroys infrastructure and things like that and so you know we could see this home obviously is getting trashed but here's a good aerial view there's a fissure here, a crack in the ground where it's coming out. And you could see that this is the cooler stuff out here. The hotter stuff is in the red. It's flowing down slope. And as it gets farther away, you can see that it cools. The outside kind of cools, but there's still this ever creeping flow in this home. Mm, that's in trouble, right? So this is the, the lava flow is a hazard that can happen be for multiple volcanoes but we mostly associate it with the mafic which are shield volcanoes right so hawaii or places where we have just this very fluid lava coming to the surface can flow long distances and that's the biggest hazard now there are some gases released here too and that can be a hazard and so if we look at let's see what i got for you here so if we jump to the usgs page which you can do from the link in the powerpoint you can see under lava flows here it talks a little bit about you know how they flow and how far so steepness of the ground is a factor of you know how far it'll flow and typically you know we don't see they're usually basaltic right that's our mafic stuff you can get more viscous stuff this is an andesite that's the intermediate stuff it doesn't flow as far and right and so you know and it talks about you can read through this the different types of problems with that mostly fires and destruction of property and it goes over roads and buildings and things like that so this is what we want to think about when we think about the lava flows and some of the issues with that there's not a whole lot of prevention here but the good news is it moves slow enough that you could probably get out of the way and so the prevention here is information, right? Is telling people what's going on, is educating people on where the flows are going and how fast and, and what to do so that we can get out of the way and then basically not have any, you know, deaths from lava flows. And usually that's the case because they move fairly slow once they move away from the vents there, right? So we got some lava flows. That's a problem, of course. Um, I'm going to jump to this slide here really fast. And just because it's associated a lot of times with these lava flows, these emissions come out with those, we get gases, okay? And so one of the, the main problems here is, you know, of course, there's gases that come out that are toxic if inhaled. So if we breathe in those, then that's a problem. Uh, CO2, which doesn't is not super toxic per se, but it's a it does come out of volcanoes and it's heavier than air and so one of the issues we see is in low-lying areas you can build up a lot of co2 it displaces the oxygen if you hike down into that low-lying area there's no oxygen and you could suffocate potentially because the co2 has displaced all the oxygen and so if we jump back over to our little usgs page here we can see there's a volcanic glass yeah <laughs> a volcanic gas section and so it talks about the different types of gases that come out now look the, the most abundant is water vapor that's the one that's the most abundant but that's not necessarily toxic the ones that we're concerned about are the carbon dioxide right the co2 this sulfur dioxide this hydrogen sulfide and some other hydrogens gases that come out so some of these are problematic for the atmosphere or the ozone some are just obviously uh, toxic if you inhale them they're damaging to the lungs and things like that there are certainly documented cases of co2 killing people once again because when it comes out of the event or even from an eruption it's heavy you can't see it it sinks down low areas and if people are trapped in there then that can be a problem so certainly these gases are another hazard 
they can be associated with any type of volcano, right? Because all volcanoes have some sorts of gas in it. Now, the mafic ones, those come out a lot easier uh, sometimes, you know, but we can get these little vents that are just kind of pushing out lots of gases. So we have to be concerned about those. And so same thing here, monitoring is key. So we have a lot of monitoring systems around volcanoes and they're testing the air quality around there, seeing what's coming out, things like that. So we might be aware if there's more or less gases being kind of taken out of the magma chamber there. And so we can monitor that and then we can inform people once again of problems with uh, increased gases or things like that. And so this is one of the issues that we talk about when we talk about volcanoes. And of course, like we said, it can uh, move across all types of volcanoes because they have the ability to move gases around. And then I'm going to jump back, I guess, to let's do this one. And so this is a, another hazard. It's called a pyroclastic flow. And so these are these images here kind of give you an idea of what they look like. They're, they can form in a couple different ways. They're typically associated with our intermediate and felsic volcanoes. So, right, that's the stratovolcano, right, Cascades, Mount Fuji stuff. Or these felsic either domes, these small little structures that are super thick and gooey and form domes, or these very large, what are called caldera-type volcanoes, right? So these come from an eruption that ejects particles into the atmosphere. And so a lot of times there's a small eruption that ejects things vertically, but they're heavy. Gravity's pulling them down. So what happens is you get an ejection of big, small stuff goes up here, but then it falls back down, hits the side of the volcano and runs down the side super fast, really hot, up to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. And it has gases and it has rocks and debris. It's pretty much unsurvivable if you're in the way of a pyroclastic flow. And they can be pretty fast, 100 miles per hour, let's say. And so once again, you know, the USGS page has a description of those things. So we could take a look at that here. They're calling it these pyroclastic density currents, still pyroclastic flow. And of course, here's some other images of it racing down the sides here. It talks about how you get one, the eruption column, right? This is a blast upward. And of course, that heavy material falls back down, hits the side of the volcanoes and races down the sides. So you can get pyroclastic flows from that. You can get this boiling over effect of vents. You can get the collapse of structures that are being built up there, right? They're, they're building these thicker materials come out and they're very steep sided and unstable if they collapse then that material can move down the sides of the volcano and generate a pyroclastic flow so you can take a look at that here and i happen to have if i can find it here for you so we've got this kind of example here of a pyroclastic flow and so you can see here this one was caused by this is a little dome or a little piece of the volcano sitting up high that's relatively young and new and unstable. And when it collapsed, it basically starts moving down slope. But because it's relatively new, lots of gas is trapped in there and it starts racing down. It's super hot. It's going down this gully here. This is a pyroclastic flow. And if you're in the way of that, that's a problem. So super fast because the slopes are usually steep. These are generally associated with these intermediate, right? Here it comes. You are here, you are running, right? You are trying to get out of the way because if that envelops you, that's a problem. And so usually in, in the strato cones, because the steep side of the volcano is what's helping it go super fast. Now, lucky for those people there, it kind of peters out here when it gets flat because you know, gravity is not being pulled down that steep side, you know, and so it's it's losing some of its energy from that. But if it, you know, could make it to this road, then those people would have been in trouble, right? So that's basically a pyroclastic flow. And same thing, you know, monitoring eruptions and how things work is basically the way we would do that. And so you can look at the little video clips that are attached to uh, the module. And of course, the USGS page, right, has information about how we get those and what they're associated with typically. Okay. So what else do we have? So we went through our lava flows here. We went through our pyroclastic flows. We talked a little bit about the different gases. 
And then let's see, we're going to talk about what are called lahars. And so mud flows, yes, we kind of know what a mud flow is. We haven't really talked about the those hazards yet, but basically when we add water to debris, loose debris, and it has some steep slope, it can move down slope fairly quickly and it's bringing water, mud, dirt, everything all mixed together. Because volcanoes are steep, so when water hits the side of the volcano, it's going to run down the sides. And because the way volcanoes throw out ash that falls down and sticks to the sides of the mountains and unstable rocks, it can pick up all that loose debris and move down slope. And you can see here there's some damage done by a lahar. And so how do we protect people from that? Well, we make maps. Here's one of Mount Rainier that shows it's mapping out old lahars. they moving down the sides of the mountain and then following stream channels. And so if a lahar has come there in the past, it's probably a good bet that this is a pathway for additional lahars should we get water added to the volcano. And so there's a couple ways we can do that. Certainly heavy rainfall can cause a mud flow, or in this case, what we're going to call a lahar because it's associated with a volcano. But we can also get a lava oozing out in the top. And if it's a high mountain and there's snow or ice, it can melt that, right? Now I have water and my water is moving down slope, picking up debris along the way. So a lot of times you don't need a huge blast eruption to generate a lahar. You can have a relatively subdued eruption that just brings lava to the surface and it flows down a little bit. But if there's a lot of ice and snow at the peak of the volcano, that's a problem. And you get these huge lahars that race down the slopes of volcanoes. And if there's a town at the base, that's a problem, of course. And so I'll show you a real quick video too. This is an example of a lahar being channeled right so let's see where we're at here we'll go ahead and play it and so there's a channel here and it's trying to they built this channel to funnel this out and here it comes right even you can see the volcano in the distance it's pretty far away so it's come down here and then funneled down to a stream channel and then they're trying but you could see it's overflowing the sides of the stream channel or this kind of whatever canal they've built to kind of funnel it away from you know buildings and people and so here's another example of a lahar so it's come from a fair distance and it's bringing debris most of it is water whether that's from a heavy rainstorm or the melting of ice or snow on top of a volcano these things can be pretty dangerous when mount st helens erupted there was a lot of lahars racing down the sides and into stream channels and that was bringing lots of debris and of course if your cabin is hanging out over here on the side you can see that that's a problem and so you know depending on how large the lahar is it's going to indicate you know how much damage it can do and how well controlled you can see that's a pretty big boulder here that, that kind of escalated pretty quickly so if you're in the way, that's definitely a problem. So that's what we're going to call lahars. And then I have, let's see here, I've got the USGS page here for you. And of course, we can go look at lahars. And same thing, it, there's a brief description. There's some imagery that shows you some of the devastation lahars can cause. It talks about what it looks like. And here's the key we talked about, right? You don't need a big volcanic eruption to generate these. So melting snow and ice can be, you know, the, the water that's needed to generate these. And all you need is some heat, maybe a little fissure eruption or things like that. And you could cause a big event to happen, right? And so a lot of material moving down slope can cause damage to structures and things like that. And so a little more information about lahars that you can take a look at. So we've gone through kind of the lava flows, lahars, gases. We've almost got them all. So we'll jump real fast to, let's look at our, now secondary, this secondary effects, the flooding, of course, is really super related to the lahar so the water comes down and then you know it overtops stream channels and basically becomes a flood event because all that water is coming down the you know sides of the volcano because of the eruption or some type of 
you know, lava or material that melts snow and ice on the top. And so we can certainly get some flooding. Um, where is the one I wanted to show you, which is, so there also is some other secondary stuff that I'll just touch on real fast, I guess. We're talking about water. Depending on where our volcano is, if we have an eruption that happens under the ocean, we can displace water and generate tsunamis. We can have blasts that generates tsunamis. And so the uh, Krakatoa event, which uh, I think we're watching this week in lab as part of your lab, you're going to see that when that erupted, it generated a large tsunami because it was an island volcano. It displaced a lot of water and a huge tsunami was generated from that. So a secondary effect from the blast. So certainly generating these big sea waves that move out across the ocean and strike coastlines is definitely a hazard that we want to be aware of. And we can monitor those with certain devices in the ocean basins that tell us a tsunami was generated. And then... Do, do, do earthquakes so earthquakes because of moving magma in the subsurface as it's trying to make it to the surface it's putting pressure on the rocks causing stress which can cause the rocks to fracture and break and those can be recorded as earthquakes on our seismographs and if we get an increase in earthquakes could be an indicator that an eruption is due it's one of the ways we monitor volcanoes but of course, just the you know earthquake itself can cause some damage to local structures and things like that, just like a regular earthquake would. And then this uh, kind of ash fall, which is that tephra kind of stuff. And so if we look at the, the USGS page, it's one of the first things it kind of talks about here, this tephra and ash. And so this is, you know, the very fine grained, fine small pieces that are ejected from a explosive eruption. So the big heavy pieces get blown up into the atmosphere, fall back down, can race down the sides and generate a pyroclastic flow, remember? But the really small pieces kind of stay up in the atmosphere. They hang up in there, they drift in the wind for a little bit, but eventually they fall down, almost like snow, but they can build up if it's a large eruption. And so it can bury structures and things like that. And so one of the big issues that we run into is not just that you could inhale it, which would be bad for you or any living creature to inhale these particles into your lungs. But you can see here it talks about how it impacts infrastructure, right? So imagine it falling on rivers and streams and polluting streams, and that's an issue for our water system. You can't fly planes or drive cars through it very well because the ash would clog up the engines and that would be an issue. If it builds up on structures, it has some mass to it. It's like, think about it like a snowfall. If you get enough of it, it's heavy and it can collapse structures, bury things, of course. So it talks a little bit about some of the other dangers of ejecting lots of ash into the atmosphere. And I think we've got the one little, let's see here, where is it? So we've got the example, if I can find it really fast for you, of this here. So this is a little ash fall from Mount St. Helens. So here's an eruption. You can kind of see all the material here. This is all really fine grain stuff that's being ejected. It's super light. So it stays in the atmosphere. And so what you see is first, you know, it looks like it's pretty smoggy, but here it is kind of falling. If it, there's some rain associated with it, it can drag it down, but it looks like snow. And you can see it building up here. Now Mount St. Helens wasn't an enormous eruption, but there certainly was enough ash to cover things locally in a couple inches for sure. And farther away might get smaller amounts, but that's a problem, of course. You know, if you're breathing that and you could see this guy here, you know, talking about uh, a little snow falling. So I guess this is the best kind of thing to visualize what ash fall would look like. And so one of the so one of the issues with that is that it um sorry about that weird cut there. It is that it could build up over time, and then that weight could be a problem, right? So if we go back to the USGS page, you can kind of read through there. And so what I've also kind of mentioned too was this issue here where 
yes, the ash is a problem for kind of breathing in and potentially, you know, endangering aviation and infrastructure. But the bigger picture is large scale eruptions that eject lots of stuff into the atmosphere can actually alter the climate. And so we run into a little bit of issue with that if it's a very large eruption. And so one of the things that we might hear when you watch shows is like Yellowstone is what they call a super volcano. In the geologic past, it has erupted a lot of material and that potentially caused, you know, the temperature worldwide to change by a couple degrees. It would cool it off because it blocks sunlight. And if it's a large enough eruption, you know, that can disturb lots of things, right? So crop damage, food supplies, uh, water supplies get damaged, you know. So there could be some chaos from a, a very, very large eruption. We've never seen, there's never been recorded a super eruption like that. But in the geologic record, there's evidence of tens of meters of ash that has fallen. That's, you know, we're talking, you know, potentially 100 feet of ash burying areas. And obviously that's a problem for these very large eruptions. And so we want to think about some of those hazards when we talk about the ash fall, not just breathing in stuff, but also these bigger picture issues that can come from ejecting lots of ash or tephra into the atmosphere. And then the last couple things we'll just talk about. So those are the main hazards. And so we need a blast to get our ash fall for sure. So we don't really see that with our mafic uh, erupting volcanoes. So not really the shield volcanoes, but certainly when we see calderas or stratovolcanoes, we get this ash fall. And so really the key here is that stratovolcanoes, those intermediate, they do it all. And this is why they're the most dangerous. There's a lot of them, one, and they have all of these hazards. Lava flows, sure. You get uh, ash fall, yep. Pyroclastic flows, yes. Volcanic landslides, yes. Um, lava flows, yes. Lahars, yes. So they can do it all. And because they have this range, they're in the middle, as they get more felsic, they can be pretty violent and they can eject a lot of material. As they get a little more mafic, you know, they're not as violent, but they're giving off these lava flows and gases and things like that. The very rare ones, which are the super volcanoes, not so much because they're rare. They, they almost never happen. When they do, they're horrific and we know there's some around, but they've never erupted in human history. So you know, where do you place your, your bets on, you know, what are you, what are you worried about? The ones that are going off all the time that have potential to do some pretty good damage or the one that might go off in a hundred thousand years that could do severe damage, right? So for now we focus more on the stratovolcanoes because they can do it all. Okay. Uh, the last thing is we talk a little bit about prediction. How do we monitor these things? We monitor them by looking at uh, seismic studies. So we talked about earthquakes, as the magma is moving, it can cause earthquakes. An increase in earthquakes can tell us something about the movement of magma and potentially an eruption. We can look at a few other things, ground deformation, right? As the magma moves up, it causes the land surface to bulge up. T changes in water temperature because we have a heat source and groundwater is getting heated. Even the ground temperature, we talked about gases coming out. So these are kind of the things that we look at to predict volcanic eruption and prepare people. So, hey, you know, this, this thing's pretty active. We want to evacuate people. We want to warn people. We want to educate people. And, of course, we talk a little bit about making maps. That's another way that we prevent people from being, you know, injured by these things. Be aware that, hey, if you live over here, you're in a lahar hazard area. And if there's an eruption here, even though... You're, it doesn't have to be a huge one, and even though you're fairly far away, you still could be impacted by these hazards that can travel far from the source. So lahars can travel hundreds of miles from the volcano. Ashfall can fall hundreds of miles from the volcano. So those are kind of long-distance hazards, as opposed to, let's say, you know, volcanic gases are pretty local. Lava flows usually don't travel very far unless... You're in Hawaii and you have a mafic volcano, right? And so this is just an example of a map that shows what happened in Mount St. Helens. So we know, you know, where did the mud flows go? Oh, they went this far, right? 
Where's the debris avalanches? Where was the blast deposits? So if there's another eruption, we can maybe say, hey, this is a danger zone. We got to get people out of that area. All right. Lastly, and I'm going to jump back to our USGS page here. And I'm going to put a little caveat in here. I didn't really mention volcanic landslides when we were talking about hazards. And so they're just what you think they are. It's the idea that you can cause part of the volcano to move down slope and debris without adding water. So that would be a mud flow. Here's just a landslide. And typically we can get them from a variety of reasons, but here's kind of the, the ones that are more common. We have magma moving in the thing, causing a bulge, comes unstable, it collapses. Eruptions themselves can cause failure of part of the volcano. Earthquakes, we said, right, were happening and that can cause failure. So these are kind of landslide triggers that we see on volcanoes. So even though there's not even an eruption, it can just be hanging out. But steep sided volcanoes, here again, we're focusing on our strato volcano. These are the problem children, right, because they're steep sided and that makes them unstable and they're prone to some of these landslides. So you can quick take a look at that there. And for the, the preparedness and slash monitoring stuff, it's just right here. Just like I went over in the slide, if I can get it to work, there it is. So what are some of the things we monitor? Earthquakes, deformation, gas and water, hydrology, more water stuff, heat and thermal, right? Temperatures of water, temperatures of the land, topographic changes. That's more kind of deformation stuff. So this is kind of, I just want you to know ways we monitor. You don't have to visit each one of these. I'm hoping with kind of going through some of the slides, talking about some of these hazards, that uh, that's enough information, kind of makes you understand what hazards are associated with what. But of course, we also just want you to be aware of what are the hazards? What are volcanic hazards? Well, here's the list right here. And you should be able to tell the difference between these types, right? Ashfall, lava flows, I think most people can get that. Volcanic gases kind of make sense. So it's really just understanding what a pyroclastic flow is and a lahar. Those might be new terms for you. But once we hopefully have talked about it or you've seen images or read a little bit about it, it shouldn't be too bad. All right. I think that's enough information talking about volcanic hazards. So... The sources here are this video you're watching, the PowerPoint that kind of summarizes this stuff, and the USGS page that there's a link to in both the module and in this PowerPoint here that you can go to and kind of pop into those kind of quick little hazards, read a little bit about them and understand them, and then you should be good. All righty, so I think we've gone through the stuff that we needed to. So if you're, uh, if you're still confused about some of the things that we talked about here in this lecture, please feel free to reach out to me and ask me some questions and I will do my best to clarify some of the information here. Otherwise, uh, I think we're good. So I think that'll be it.